On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to talk about the pre-pre-tribulation rapture. Now, the first time we approached this issue was in our September magazine. Gary Stearman wrote it because there seems to be a number of scriptures in the Bible that says that this or that or the other will happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So, thinking that the rapture is one of those things that's going to happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord, what we want to know is how long before. Since there's no scripture that says that, the, that immediately following the rapture is the tribulation period, we have to at least take up the issue. Gary Stearman is here with a second installment for our November magazine. Let's talk about the pre, pre-tribulation rapture. Pre, pre-tribulation, meaning that there is a space of time prior to the onset of the tribulation, uh, and somewhere in that space of time, the church is taken up, and then certain events uh, have to unfold before this event occurs. Daniel 9, 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. This, of course, would be the Antichrist. Daniel calls him the prince who shall come. Now, this prince uh, has some kind of power. He must have power in, in order to be able to confirm this covenant with the leaders of Israel. Da the, the context of Daniel tells us that he signs the covenant allowing them to perform temple worship. And then at some point later, uh, in the middle of the tribulation, he withdraws that permission and says, no, you can't do that anymore. But it is his signature on the covenant in the first place that starts the seven-year tribulation, which we believe will be a Shavua, that is, a seven-year mm -hmm. uh, sabbatical period. And the fascinating thing here is there is no rapture even intimated before this takes place. That's so right. When before does the rapture take place? And I guess another question would be under what circumstances? Now, we think of the church today as in a state of almost bated breath. We're in a state of anticipation. We're waiting for that any moment rapture. It's the doctrine of imminency, <clears throat> uh, meaning without any foreshadowing, without any sign or any fulfillment of any particular prophecy, Jesus could appear in the air and take us home. And we really believe this as a point of doctrine. But J.R., this is fairly recent in the church age. If you go back 150, 200 years, the idea of imminency was not so much as spoken of. Now, you can go back to the days of Paul and the apostles. They expected Jesus to come. But then there was a long period in the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, all the way up through the Reformation period when the doctrine of imminency fell out of favor. So I began by asking the question, why is this true? And, I, and the answer is very obvious. It's because you can't have the doctrine of imminency unless Israel is in the land. Absolutely. The very fact that Daniel 9, 27 talks about him making a treaty or confirming the the covenant so that Israel can begin with some kind of temple liturgy it means that they have to be there and have access to the mountain. Yes, and when they do, and by the way, it's fascinating the way this started reviewing. Going back to the 19th century, we discover the rise of dispensationalism. When men began to say, the Bible prophesies the return of Israel. And at first, that was a strange doctrine, J.R. To yes. us, it's very familiar. But back before the 20th century, uh, it was not a popular doctrine at all. The church believed that it would set up a kingdom of sorts on earth, and that Israel would never return. Then came the dispensational movement, uh, Darby, Schofield, others, and, and they determined that no, it there is prophecy saying Israel shall return to the land. And then Israel did return to the land. And people began to say, wait a minute. All the little pieces are coming together. This means that Jesus could come at any moment. Mm -hmm. So the super sign would be the return of the Jews to the land of their forefathers. Right. Once the Jews are back in their land, then we begin to notice 
this prophecy is fulfilled, that prophecy is fulfilled, etc. And what we have then is uh, by the time we get to 1967 and the Six Day War and the taking of the Temple Mount mm -hmm. and the taking of East Jerusalem, we have things really perking up. Preachers then begin to say Jesus is coming soon. That was a new message. It was a brand new message. Now Paul links the rapture with the temple. And this is fascinating. Second Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except uh, there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth <coughs> and exalteth himself above all that is called God, excuse me, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, subject here, Second Thessalonians, Paul's talking about the rapture. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, he mentions the man of sin, standing up in the temple and calling himself God. So the, the two ideas are linked together. The, 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 uh, the day, that is the day of the Lord, the tribulation can't come except there come this falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. There he is again, that man of sin. Uh, Daniel talked about him signing that covenant. That starts tribulation period. And so he's, Paul is very clearly saying this covenant by extension must be signed. That man must have power and he must be rise to a point where he stands up and calls himself God before um, any of this can be called imminent. Now think if you were alive back in Paul's day. The temple was still in operation. Mm -hmm. Daily operation when he wrote this. And so anyone receiving this letter could say, well, that Paul, Brother Paul is telling us that that man is soon going to stand up in the temple and call himself God. But before that, we're going to be gone home to be with the Lord. And this falling away that uh, the scripture refers to here is actually the, the catching away. That's what church. we believe, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the disappearance. Catch, the disappearance. The catching away can't come except there come a... So we know that the rapture is going to come before the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. And by extension, before the uh, Antichrist confirms the covenant. So that's a pre-tribulation And having rapture. said that, we have the classic pre-tribulation rapture laid out. Now... The church's doctrine of imminency is so closely tied to Israel. It's amazing. If you stop and think about John Nelson Darby, and I've chronicled this in the article. We don't have time to go through all the details. But John Nelson Darby uh, read the Bible, and from that he demonstrated the proposition that Israel would return to the land. And his brothers, they came to be called the Plymouth Brethren, began to study the Bible dispensationally. Along came C.I. Schofield, picked up their teaching. And the interesting thing about this is that out of their teaching, J.R., two things came. The great world missionary movements and the movement of Israel back to the land. Those two things happened at the same time, really, or in the same uprising, if you will, or flowing forth of the Holy Spirit. And so the doctrine of imminency, the, the return again of Israel, and the proclamation of the gospel throughout the world all happened at once. Just boom, right in the middle of nowhere. And suddenly, uh, as you say, it wasn't very long before pastors were saying, Jesus is coming soon. Mm -hmm. Now, Micah is the great Old Testament prophet it talks about Bethlehem being the birthplace of the Messiah. But it's interesting to me that that particular verse, But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth uh, unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That verse is set within the context of the overall picture of the last days. Listen to chapter 4 verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass. Mm -hmm. So what we have here in chapters 4, 5, and 6, and 7, Micah's 
um, discussion of the end time and what I think will be the rapture of the church. But just, just digressing from that, he is saying the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And the next verse says that he will give up Israel because of their unbelief. They mm -hmm. will reject him until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. In other words, the time of the regathering of Israel. In 1948 has been the regathering of Israel. From that point, what we have in chapters 5 and 6 up to chapter 7, verse 1, is the building toward the rapture mm -hmm. and then the tribulation. So let's begin with chapter 1 and look at the rapture as it is in the book of Micah. Uh, and now are you talking about chapter 7, verse 1? Yes, sir. All right. Chapter 7, verse 1. <clears throat> Micah is uh, speaking as a prophet. He is an Israelite. He's speaking as Israel. He's the voice of Israel. And there's, there's this plaintive cry. It says, Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits. As the grape gleanings of the vintage, there is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. This is a man in desperate straits. And we know contextually that he is uh, speaking for latter-day regathered Israel. Because as you laid out the, te the text of the book, the context yes. of Micah, tells us that this is Israel in the latter days. Next sentence, Micah 7, 2, the good man is perished out of the earth. There's none upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. So this commentator is looking all around him and saying, there's not a soul you can trust. Morality and ethics is gone. The good man is perished out of the earth. And here's the, the interesting part. Perished is from the Hebrew uh, avad, which means to disappear. So well, let's read it. The good man has disappeared out of the earth. Yes. Now, the question, who is Israel's best friend? You know, J.R. and I know. Yeah. It's the, uh, the evangelical Christian. The Christian who understands the dispensations, who understands Israel's return to the land, who prays for the peace of Jerusalem, wants only the best, wants the blessing of God to fall upon national Israel. That's Israel's friend. And J.R., that's precisely the man who's going to be taken out in the rapture. If the church has to go through any part of the tribulation period, he couldn't write that. He says here, the good men is perished. They all lie in wait. There is none upright among men. Gary, that means there's not a single saint on this planet. True. That means the rapture had to take place. And J.R., we have a little clue here in sentence number one where Micah says, Woe is me, I as am, I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits. Jesus talked about the harvesting of the fruit. Yeah. And he said the harvest is the end of the world or right the on. end of the age. Yes. Well, that's what we're talking about here. Absolutely. <laughs> the end of the age. And what happens at the end of the age? Well, the grape gleanings of the vintage have just come to their conclusion. That's the language of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. The grapes of wrath. Mm -hmm. When the sickle is plunged into the, the wine vat. Uh, and the blood flows forth in the battle of Armageddon. We're talking about language here that's tribulational. The world has to digress down in or tumble down into the tribulation period because of Micah's statement here mm -hmm. that everything has deteriorated. Right. Okay? There's nobody that's worth the powder it'd take to blow them up. Absolutely. Ethics, <clears throat> none. Honesty, gone. Listen to what he says. The prince asketh, that is the politician, needs to grease the palm a little bit mm -hmm. before he'll do anything yes. for anybody. The judge asks for a reward. So the judge takes bribes. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, those are supposed to be the people the world looks up to. Oh, yeah. If there's anybody that's good, it ought to be the prince. Yeah. It ought to be the judge. But, there's, but even they... Are corrupt. They're corrupted. And there's another man mentioned here, the great man. He uttereth his mischievous desire. And so they weave it all together. 
Now, the great man here would be the statesman, yeah, the great leader, the man who's supposed to be strong and firm and rooted in morality and ethics. And well, above the fray. Above the fray. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's not. Dirty. He's a dirty politician. Mm -hmm. And the, the verse 3 here of Micah 7 says that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. There's nothing stopping them. The prince asketh, the judge asketh for reward. The great man, he uttereth his mischievous desires. So they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh now shall wow. be their perplexity. And the word now there does not mean right now. It means as a result of all the foregoing, mm -hmm. you're going to see perplexity. And I carefully researched this in the Hebrew language, and, and, it, and it, what it does is give us a picture of the post-church world, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we see here, the day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. That's a, an impending invasion of, of national Israel. It hasn't happened yet. Sound like Gog and Magog, doesn't it? It does sound like Gog and Magog. In fact, uh, the word for watchman is mitzafaneach in Hebrew, and it means one who watches, but it also has a word root in it, according to uh, particularly some of the older authorities, uh, grammatical authorities. It has a word in it that means the watchman looks to the north. Uh, to his the gaze, northern invasion. Yeah, his gaze is extended out to the north. And Micah says, uh, he says, the day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. So we've had the rapture. We've had a period of time for society to degenerate following the rapture, but we have not yet had the invasion from the north. By the way, Gary, if there ever was a scripture for a pre-tribulation rapture, this has got to be it. Oh, yes. I cannot imagine any saint living at that period of time because listen to uh, verse 5, trust ye not in a friend. Yeah. You can't put any confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of your mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. You can't even trust your wife. That's pretty bad. She would sell you out. Yeah. You know, this reminds, reminds us of the days of the Nazi era in Germany when family members would sell each other out to the Nazi party. Uh, yeah. It's going to be that bad, but much, much worse than it's ever been before because there will be no church, no redeem. Now, you know, there, uh, there are family problems that are rampant even today in our mm -hmm. generation. And I suppose there are times when uh, a man has to be careful not to antagonize his wife because she knows how to get him. <laughs> she knows how to bury him under the jail, you know. Right. She knows things about him nobody else knows. Well, in that day, there will be no compunction. There will be no ethics. There will be no restraining right. of evil because there will be no saints. None. Now, zilch. Go ahead. Now, before we continue, and we're going to look further at this idea of restraint, let's look at the idea of a northern invasion. Because Jeremiah, speaking of the, these days, says, Set up a standard toward Zion, retire. Stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. Jeremiah 4, 6. And then uh, Ezekiel 38, 15. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee. Uh, all of them riding upon horses with a great company and a mighty army, Ezekiel 38, 15. And then Isaiah 14, speaking of the same period, Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina art dissolved. Now, isn't it interesting that he uses the word Palestina? Yeah. Because there's a group of people who want to change the name of Israel back to Palestine. Yeah. And it's, he says, thou... Whole Palestina art dissolved, <clears throat> for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. Mm. There it is. I mean, that watchman's looking to the north, yeah, and he's looking for that invasion which is to come. Uh, Micah said, woe is me. The good man's disappeared. He's gone, and with him has gone ethics and morality. In the New Testament, 
uh, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 9, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, there is a Greek verb that's used throughout this passage. It's a Greek verb, katako, which means to grab on something and hold it back or restrain it so that it can't move. Or it's also used in the Greek language to describe holding a lid on something. Keeping a lid on is used with this verb. Well, what we have here is law lawlessness being spoken of as being restrained in its development. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, that is uh, restrained, catico, holds back or holds the lid on, uh, will hold the lid on, let, until he be taken out of the way. We have here the restrainer, we have one who restrains, and it's used with the present participle so that it literally translates the restraining one mm -hmm. is holding the lid on until he be taken out of the way. Yeah, and that would be the church. That would be the body of saints around the world that are keeping the lid on immorality yes. and the rampant rise of the uh, Antichrist government. We are really the world's only hope for keeping back the mm -hmm. onslaught right. of the satanic forces. Yeah. But it's getting harder and harder, harder for us, and Gary. Harder. It, you know, sometimes we get so discouraged, it looks like, and depressed. We, uh, we just can't do it. We, every time we elect somebody, you know, that promises all these things on, on, on the night of the election when they have their big parties and they drink their martinis, they take all their promises to us and drop them in file 13. That's right. And yeah. one of these days, we're going to be gone and we'll, there will be no restraint whatsoever. So connect this with Micah. Yes. And you see that the righteous have to be gone before the tribulation period sets in. And Jara, this is one of the first of our arguments in favor of a, a rather long space between the rapture and the initiation of the tribulation. Because just as Paul says here, the restrainer has to be taken out of the way before the one who comes after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders comes. In other words, the one can't happen without the other. So some time must pass between the removal of the restrainer and the rise of the Antichrist. How much time? Well, I'm still working on that. And <laughs> in the install <laughs> installments to come. Yeah, well, Gary, we're waiting with bated <laughs> breath for you to tell us exactly how long it's going to be. I would be willing to say this right <laughs> now, Jr. that it's probably at least three and a half years in length. That is the space between the rapture and the tribulation for reasons we'll cite later. Wow, that's amazing. Well, the disciples ask the Savior in Matthew 24, tell us when shall those things be? And we know that he spends a great deal of time discussing that. Um, Gary, we're just about out of time. Any final word? Well, the final word is the idea of the rapture is not the idea of escape. Nor is it the idea of reward. You don't have to demonstrate how great you are in order to be taken in the rapture. You don't have to do anything special. You just have to be a member of the body of Christ. And at a particular time in the flow of history, the church will have to go in order for all these other scheduled events to take place. And you'll be one who goes when the church goes, not because of anything you personally have done, but because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I had a minister one time say that the faithful will be taken, but the unfaithful Christians, those backsliders, will have to go into the tribulation period so they can be cleaned up, you know. Yeah. Well... Not according to Micah chapter 7. Oh, no. They said nobody, nobody good is left in this world. So, 
If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you better think very, very, difficult, uh, very hard about this because once we're gone, your eyes may be blinded to accept the Antichrist. There's no promise, no, no absolute guarantee that you'll have the opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior once we're gone. Oh, you might, but there's no guarantee of that. So I would ask you to trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Just pray a simple sinner's prayer. Tell the Lord you know you're a sinner and you're sorry. Ask Him to forgive you and save you. If you will, He will. He stands ready and waiting, wanting to give you eternal life. And you don't have to earn it. All you have to do is repent of your sins, apologize, and ask Him to save you. I'm J.R. Church with Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.